ai te whai i ao ki te ao mārama tihei Māori ora. Te wehi ki a ihoa i te wāhi ngaro, te timatanga te whakāro nui. Ka whakahono re tia tō tātou kingi, a kingi tu hei tia pota tau te whero whero te tua whitu. Nei rā wāku mihi ki a koutou te whare o pota tau, tainu i waka, tainu i tangata tēnā koutou. Wāku mihi ki a koutou hoki e ngā taranga are are o e nei kōrero. Mauri ora ki a koutou katoa. Ka uri tēnei nō te hikapui a te aroa, ko ngā te piki ao te iwi, ko ngā te tirangi nora e mihi atu nei tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Dr. Kepa Morgan, the creator of the Modi Model Decision Making Framework and your facilitator for this session on energy and local initiatives. FlexRoot's understandings of climate change response that can help to reverse our declining Modi of our ecosystems are needed. Understandings of solutions from those working at the FlexRoot's are important because it is, a, is the effective implementation of climate change response that will make a difference. We have six panelists today who will share what their local initiatives have been doing to address the impacts of climate change. I have asked each panelist to hand over to the next speaker when they finish, and after their contributions, we will wānanga on the collective insights gained. So over to our first speaker, Mike West, well, Energy Trust. Tēnā koe, Mike. Uh, Michael West, uh, as Kepa mentioned, I'm the chair of the Well Energy Trust. Um, and uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit today about the, um, the influence of governance on the uptake of initiatives and climate change responses. Uh, I think the theme being think globally, act locally does... Uh, lend itself to needing to understand how governance entities can influence that, uh, that uptake. Um, the act locally part of it uh, can be broken down into some very small sectors. In my particular instance, the Well Energy Trust is a entity of its own, but it does own a significant player in the electricity and energy industry, which is Well Network. So, uh, so just to give you a little bit of a heads up on what the structure of my organisation is, the Well Energy Trust was set up to own the shares in Well Networks. So it's 100% owner of Well Networks. Uh, it has a, a board of trustees which is elected every three years and uh, the board of trustees has a, uh, a governance role to run its own entity under the guidelines put down in the trust deed. Uh, one of the things that the trust deed is fairly uh, strong on is that a core responsibility of the trustees is to ensure that it's the company that, are, that it owns runs as a successful company. And uh, we've interpreted that to uh, not be just a, a financially successful company, but also a, an environmentally and socially successful uh, company. So, so the impact that we have as a governance group within our own entity does flow on to our ownership of Well Networks. So basically Well Networks is our core investment. Uh, as a standalone initiative, we also have non-core investments. So also keeping with the theme of, uh, of climate responsibility, we, we have a significant amount of money under investment uh, and we insist that those investments are both ethically, responsibly and sustainably uh, made investments. Um, we're a philanthropic entity and we have a uh, responsibility to income beneficiaries. We're able to make community grants and impact investments and by utilising our powers within those, uh, those areas, we can have some influence over initiatives that we see as being uh, both worthwhile in terms of how they return financially, but also how they return to the, uh, to the greater good of our environment, our community. Uh, one thing I know about um, governance is that it has to be done in a reasonably moderate sort of a way, and it's always controlled by a, uh, a set of rules, in our case, a trust deed. Um, it's important not to be too extreme with your, with your uh, 
direction as a, particularly as an elected trust, as elected representatives. Uh, we're elected every three years and naturally we, um, we do need to meet the expectations of our electorate and what, uh, what we've seen in the past and probably the future is if we're too extreme in our, in our uh, direction, we will get change for a, uh, a newly elected trust. So um, we have to have regard to our beneficiaries in, in more than just one area. Owning well networks is um, obviously the, the area that we can contribute significantly to in the uh, climate change arena. Uh, our own entity, the Well Energy Trust, is, has a very small carbon footprint. We're a, um, just a small office. We've got six trustees, five staff. We don't run a fleet of vehicles. We work out of an office and what have you. However, Well Networks, uh, although in itself it's not a massive carbon footprint, uh, it does have uh, has some ability to reduce its contribution. Um, but it, uh, in its role as a network provider, it's able to uh, future-proof and to provide support for new technologies that are coming on board, which are much more focused on, on large-scale carbon reduction. The uh, exa couple of examples of, of where we're at, um, so first of all, in terms of our structure, we appoint the board of directors for Well Networks and uh, the relationship between the board and the trust is one where we have a letter of expectation every year, which is um, works within our, our owner's expectation manual, which is our relationship, our sort of the formal relationship between the trust and the company. And within that document, we one of the things we specify is, a, um, is reporting on on carbon emissions and uh, and the like, so we're a little bit limited in, in what we can do. We're not able to provide any influence on the way the companies run. That is something that the directors have to provide, and of course they are controlled by uh, company law and uh, numerous other uh, requirements. The Electricity Authority, the Commerce Commission, and and various other entities uh, all looking in to see what's going on at that level. In terms of um, how we're so encouraging our company to be a little bit uh, supportive or, or quite supportive in that um, arena is um, encourage them to invest in, in energy related investments, which can provide benefits both financially and have an impact on, uh, on climate reduction or climate carbon reduction. Uh, recently, um, Well Networks purchased a company called Infratech. Now Infratech is a, uh, is a company that specialises in large solar and battery uh, technologies. And they're already using that to uh, put into play an investment in a, a BES, which is a battery energy storage system. So it's a, a large scale battery. The particular one that they are uh, going to invest in shortly is 33 megawatts. And what that will do is it will have the ability to, to take electricity from uh, uh, generation sources that are um, uh, renewable, uh, wind and solar, and then store them to be used at times when there are uh, uh, high demands on the network. Um, in addition to that, the company has just, uh, through, it, through Infratech, its subsidiary, has just received the contract to build a solar power station for a company called Lodestone Energy, which is... Uh, basically going to be building solar generation, which will service around 55,000 households. So that uh, that's an area where the company is, is lending itself to supporting infrastructure or supporting the, the ability of uh, the generation of renewables without actually being in the market itself. Um, from its own perspective, the company has undertaken a few initiatives. For instance, it's uh, um, EV electric vehicle uptake is, is um, it's a, got a program when it replaces vehicles, it looks for EV options. Unfortunately, in some of its fields, there's no electric uh, vehicles that are able to be sourced because they're just not being made. One of the initiatives that it has done is it's converted a lot of its uh, um, sort of bucket vehicles, which are the big trucks that go out on the road and, and, the, and the workers uh, go up in the elevated buckets. Uh, previously, they used to be 
operated by the diesel motor of the truck that would run and power the hydraulics so they could be working with it. Now they have upgraded them so they can drive them to the sites and they can turn the engines or turn the motors off and run with electric uh, powered hydraulics. So just just small initiatives like that, which are sort of within their, uh, well within their capacity, but mostly from the larger scale, they are doing it by way of, of um, future-proofing and supporting the, uh, the change in how we're generating power. All right, so that's all from me for now. I'd pass on to Andrew. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, ready to start. Uh, my mic's on. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I am Andrew Bitter. I'm an architect. I build lifestyles, I build communities, and I build for the future. My track record includes the 2020 Master Builders Award for the country's most sustainable house, so I am making a real difference. Today we are talking about energy, so my focus is on how buildings use energy. The New Zealand context is very different to the COP26 panels we heard from this morning. Most of our energy is renewable hydro, not coal, oil and gas, so we need to chart our own path. Copying overseas policies is not going to deliver carbon reductions to the same extent here. So let's start with the basics. Sustainable is defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Applying this to buildings, we can see that any new building that can be used by future generations is therefore, by definition, sustainable. In New Zealand, we are required to design for a minimum building lifespan of 50 years. We also have a growing population. We need more buildings regardless of energy use. So global policies that punish New Zealand for growing compared to, say, Japan or Germany, which have declining populations, is going to create more problems than it solves. This leads into carbon accounting because uh, we've got to define the issues and measure the issues properly in order to be able to solve the problems. <clears throat> now, overseas figures uh, typically quote around 40% of carbon dioxide coming from buildings. Uh, where is this figure from? I found plenty of quotes, but no sources. The New Zealand context where our electricity is from hydro uh, means that that 40% figure is wrong for New Zealand. If we stick with that sort of thing, then we are going to end up driving bad policy as a result. This is why understanding at a deeper level is important. Uh, when we look at a factory that uses a lot of energy to make something, is it the factory building? or the product that is using the energy. In reality, we have to look at who is the carbon end user. And an example of this would be a factory making solar panels. It might be using a lot of energy as a building to make the solar panels. Is the factory good or bad? You'd have to say that if it's producing solar panels, it's good. We could cut production here producing the energy use of factory buildings, but that would send factories and jobs to, say, China instead. Our emissions go down, theirs go up. Is this a good result? This is the sort of policy question we need to be analysing. So how do we set good targets and good policy? The New Zealand energy context is to do things like avoiding the gas-fired uh, Huntley power generation for peak loads. Uh, here I say we need to flatten the curve, not the COVID curve, the energy curve. For this, we need to consider the difference between residential houses and commercial buildings. Residential buildings uh, primarily use their energy for space heating and water heating in the evening and at night. Commercial buildings are predominantly using their energy for air conditioning, cooling, not heating, cooling. This is because solar gain during daylight hours is the problem. I'm going to share my screen and, and show you some pictures. You see a beautiful building. This is the type of thing 
that architects use to sell projects. It's a beautiful pr uh, computer rendering, um, looks lovely, people get excited. Here's the reality. Blinds down to stop too much glare from the overglazing, too much heat gain, uh, and it looks a mess. Blinds are a good low energy solution, but it is not the image that was sold to the client. Here is some good architecture. Shading is integrated as a design feature. It adds value. And I'll stop sharing. And uh, just to pause for a moment as I get my, my guide back on. So other considerations apart from just shading are things like roof reflectance. Painting a commercial building's roof white so that, that reflects the solar gain um, will reduce the heat buildup. And our industrial buildings in particular tend to use metal roofs. Um, if we paint it white, we can reduce the conduction of heat from the outside to the inside. We can also add more insulation. In this case, it's to stop uh, heat gain from outside the building as opposed to the residential where we're stopping heat loss from inside the building. We can look at natural ventilation of offices, more efficient air conditioning plants, solar panels on the roof for immediate use, because if it's being used during the day, unlike residential, it does not need storage for evening use and battery storage is a problem. So how do we drive good policy? Some options are legislation, building codes, incentives, the only answer is education. Legislation and codes simply complicate things. There are too many different users, too many different needs, too many localized environmental requirements. For instance, I'm currently designing a medical center where parts of the building need sheltered air. They cannot have natural ventilation. So people need the knowledge to decide for themselves. That's the core policy driver, education, not control. There is no need for incentives because good decisions that save energy, save money. That's it for me. I can pass on to Dara. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, Tina Koto. Uh, my name's Gareth Cartwright. I'm from the Community Energy Network. Um, that network is, uh, has community enterprises, uh, literally from Kaitaia to Bluff. Um, the network's been around for about 20 years, and over that time, uh, my members have probably done in the order of 300,000 healthy home assessments, and um, probably around about 120, 130,000 uh, insulation and heating retrofits, primarily through the Warmer Kiwi Homes program. But uh, uh, a number of other uh, providers there, have, uh, or partners rather, have allowed us to um, do that work. Uh, about two or three years ago, we uh, added our strategy uh, to our strategy and, and we're getting into the community energy uh, sector. Um, and it's very much a, a sector that is uh, lagging behind uh, countries that we would normally benchmark ourselves against, uh, Europe, Australia and, and uh, North America. Um, so that's kind of forming the, the basis of where I'm coming from. Um, I'd just like to uh, agree with a lot of what Andrew just said there. Um, and one point from an energy hardship point of view and how, the, how, we, how does energy hardship interact with our emissions reduction and transition work, uh, we're actually looking at a, uh, a peak in emissions required in the next few years. We've probably got the facility of 100, 150,000 homes in New Zealand out of the roughly 1.8 million. Um, that are in desperate need of deep retrofits to get the home to a livable standard. Um, we have over 2,000 people, on a normal year at least, uh, we have over 2,000 people die every winter unnecessarily because of the quality of their homes and over 40,000 children go to hospital 
every year because of the quality of their homes. So uh, those people, uh, and there's another group of probably about three, four hundred thousand homes above that uh, that are right on the cusp of causing those issues as well. Um, and if there was a drop in income in those homes, then they would be in that space as well. And I'm sure many of us have lived in those homes, maybe when we were flatting at university. Um, so those people in those homes who are struggling to survive are not remotely interested, probably, in, in climate change. They don't have the time or the energy to be interested uh, in, in, a, in a transition or, or, or being resilient or, or taking a different type of transport option. So uh, I think we need to get real a little bit with the discussions that we're having. Um, we need to uh, make sure that we're, our foundation for how we uh, make this transition is solid. And one of those is we need to pick up considerably on, on issues like quality housing uh, before we can even uh, talk about some of this other work. Um, I would just like to uh, reference a little bit what's going on at the moment with COP26, but also with the uh, emissions reduction plan that the government's um, consulting on at the moment. Um, there's a real need for us to all understand or be on the same page about what an equitable transition means. Um, and there's a lot of good guidance uh, internationally around what that is. Uh, there is no working definition that, from what I've seen uh, from our government on what equitable means. Um, and if people do want to have a look at, at what I think is a really good uh, definition, there's a the International Energy Agency have uh, set up a global commission on people-centred clean energy transitions. Um, and they've just released a report just ahead of COP26 that has 12 principles um, recommendations for, for what that transition looks like and it's excellent and, and I think uh, if, if the, our government and our communities are looking for a, a shortcut uh, to putting something in place that we can all uh, work towards then those 12 principles uh, uh, would be great. Um, I guess where I'm Leaning here is that we need a, there's a systems change required um, a, across a large well, pretty much every sector. Um, uh, my focus is on, on housing and energy. Um, I think uh, we need to have, we need to catch up basically. Uh, internationally, we need to catch up on uh, a community energy sector. Um, and the key element there is that a, a community energy, uh, a, a proper one, is one where we've got an engaged uh, society in, in energy. Um, I'm not sure how many people we can, we know who can read their energy bill well, for example. Uh, our energy literacy is very low. I think our understanding generally of how our energy sector works is very low, and for good reason, it's complex. Uh, so not wanting to sort of whitewash that too much. Um, so we need to be able to, the, the collective we, we need to work out how we can communicate, how we can educate, um, how we can support our whānau, our families um, to, to uh, understand how their homes work and how energy works um, and what are the best ways that they can interact with it to reduce the demand but also increase the performance of, of what's going on in, in the home. I think. Uh, another key element to that engagement piece is uh, ownership and ownership of the problems, but also ownership of the opportunities. So that's part of that systems change in terms of how um, the broader community can interact uh, with the energy sector. Um, there's not many ways that can be done right now. You need to have a, a, a high degree of understanding of how the sector works before you can interact with it. So uh, we need opportunities, uh, the communities need opportunities uh, to interact with it. I think our financial models need to change in terms of how we um, see investment. Uh, there's been a big push for impact investing recently, um, 
but a lot of the impact investors I've talked to still want a 15% return. Um, and if we're going to make genuine changes on environmental and, and social benefits, i.e. the impact, then that 15% return probably needs to, they need to change their horizon quite a bit and understand that if we're going to hit those impacts, we need to reinvest. We need that money to be invested in the communities in those environmental outcomes. Um, so I think there's a there's a big push here required by government and by local government, um, but I'm also quite keen on the idea that communities demand those solutions uh, to be led locally as well. I think uh, it needs to both be flex routes and top down at the same time. Um, I think that's the only way we're going to get the the uh, the speed, the urgency that we that we desperately need. Um, I think that's probably the that's probably my five minutes up. Um, I could talk for an hour on that. Uh, so thank you. Hopefully we have a good discussion later. I think I'm handing over to Stefan. Yes. Good day. Good day, everyone. My name is Stefan Heubeck. I'm a research engineer with the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research here in Hamilton. I work in the area of uh, aquatic pollution, which means I am researching wastewater treatment systems and plants, farm waste management systems, and monitor the impact of uh, aquatic pollution on aquatic environments. And um, I want to um, you know, take up the discussion here a little bit, uh, broadening the focus and uh, basically uh, focus your attention a little bit on the fact um, that everything is connected in the world of energy and greenhouse gas emissions and that we have a monumental task in our hands in those uh, remaining 30 years uh, till 2050. Um, the, one of the core issues is that um, energy and greenhouse gas emissions are sometimes hidden uh, sometimes they hide in plain sight, other times they're they are really hidden and, and really out of sight, out of mind. Um, we heard a lot about um, electricity renewables um, from previous speakers, and uh, quite often this is um, simplifying energy to mean only electricity, uh, whereas electricity is one area of interest. It is a, it's an important one. We need to make uh, greenhouse gas progress in the electricity area, but it's only one subset of the energy sector, which is only one subset of uh, industrial and uh, processing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is again only a subset of overall, overall uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And maybe to illustrate the magnitude of the problem we are faced with, um, I can, I hope I'm allowed to throw a few numbers around. Um, I um, would like you to have a think about uh, the number of 2% of all the energy that mankind is utilizing being fed into the Harbour Bosch process to synthesize atmospheric nitrogen into nitrogen fertilizer. Um, most of you probably have heard about um, nitrogen fertilizers, but not about the uh, enormous energy requirements uh, that, that are fed into these processes. Um, we use these fertilizers to increase our agricultural production. Uh, ultimately, that nitrogen uh, feeds into our food system. And being in our food system, at some stage, it will end up at your wastewater treatment plant, where we again um, use a lot of energy uh, between two and five kilowatt hours per kilogram of nitrogen to purify the water and essentially um, feed oxygen to bacteria uh, so we can convert that nitrogen where we previously expended energy for uh, up into the atmosphere again um, and in the process again uh, causing secondary uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the form of nitrous oxide where we don't even know, um, you know how large uh, that uh, contribution is. Um, if you look at um, you know, inventory numbers we're usually talking about um, estimated uh, um, emission factors. Um, so coming back to this whole concept of um, uh, think global, act local. I think this is a, a, a wonderful example where we uh, can see that um, a lot of our energy consumption, a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from areas where we wouldn't expect them to come from and where we simply cannot afford to ignore local solutions or 
um, can afford to let off the pressure at the big global players, at the big uh, industrial processes uh, to, to demand change. So for one thing, we need to become in this area of, ener of uh, energy for fertilizers, we need to become more uh, nutrient deficient. Uh, we need to use less of it. We need to think about um, getting um, renewable energy sources at an industrial scale fed into those uh, existing processes, be that uh, green hydrogen, be that uh, biogas, be that uh, biomass. Uh, but even more so, we need to think at the local level of uh, how can we um, um, you know, minimize this um, craziness going on that we uh, first expend energy to fix nitrogen and then expend more energy to unfix it again. Um, we need um, concepts um, where we uh, take some of these nutrients from waste streams, uh, convert them, purify them, and recycle them back into local agricultural um, um, production systems, um, and, and basically bypass some of these uh, um, uh, double looping. Um, quite often, these changes will cause um, secondary problems. We will um, you know, um, basically rely on other inputs. We will uh, require more machinery. Uh, sometimes we may cause uh, other um, greenhouse gas emissions, but of course, there are also other examples where uh, solving one problem uh, can um, also have uh, secondary benefits. And uh, to give you a bit uh, more hope that it's not all doom and gloom, um, some other um, areas we have been working at uh, was around the um, energy self-sufficient uh, dairy farm uh, in a New Zealand context uh, that is based on um, basically capturing fugitive methane emissions from farm manure management systems. Uh, we have a couple of uh, example sites uh, from Waikato down to uh, Southland where we have uh, dairy farms uh, that basically have uh, retrofitted quite simple systems uh, to capture methane emissions um, from their farm um, manure management systems, from the effluent ponds. Um, and uh, they capture this methane, they run generators, they generate uh, hot water. And um, basically for the larger farms we have, uh, achieving 50, 60, 70% energy cell sufficiency um, is possible. Um, and this is really something where you get um, you know, two birds with one stone. You, um, you know, harness renewable energy while also reducing fugitive uh, methane emissions. So the examples exist uh, um, for both scenarios where we have uh, synergistic benefits of, of um, improving our ways. And there will be other examples where um, you know, we're stuck um, uh, with solving one problem by creating another one. Um, Lastly, I, I just want to want to say that um, 2050, 30 years from now, is a very short time frame, and um, because of that short time frame to reach greenhouse gas neutrality, um, we cannot afford to uh, exclude any options and to um, uh, descend into turf wars. We cannot dismiss. Uh, localized small-scale initiatives like a solar panel on your roof, like the partially energy self-sufficient dairy farm, uh, like a you know district nutrient recycling system, um, we cannot afford to, uh, to dismiss this. At the same time, um, people at the grassroots level, uh, people in government, uh, cannot um, afford uh, to uh, demonize and exclude uh, whole industries. Um, we uh, cannot afford to expand. Uh, all the raw materials, all the skills, all the knowledge we spent uh, building up a fossil fuel industry, we cannot ignore it completely. It is about reusing uh, some parts of it, reusing the skills, reusing the talent in those industries. Uh, for example, um, in New Zealand, we've decided to um, 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 end the production of fossil natural gas. Um, correct step. Um, we, we cannot uh, afford to um, pump more petroleum products out of the earth and, and uh, um, keep on uh, emitting fossil CO2. Uh, but that begs, begs the question, what are we doing with our uh, natural gas pipeline system? Um, we have the technology, we have the resources to produce biogas and uh, reuse some of these um, um, assets that we already have um, and hopefully come to a greenhouse gas neutral or n lower greenhouse gas a scenario that way faster than by excluding uh, uh, everyone and, and uh, descending into turf wars uh, and trying to rebuild a utopia uh, from scratch uh, for which we certainly don't have the time and certainly won't have 
uh, the resources, the natural resources, nor the talent for. So, um, yeah, I just want to leave you with that thought and, um, yeah, pass on to Holly. Uh, kia ora, thank you, Stefan. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Holly Snape. I'm from Community Waikato. We work with community and social service organisations across the Waikato region. And we support them to strengthen organisational capacity. We facilitate networks uh, and community conversations and we provide training and development to the sector. So I'm going to talk from a community perspective today. Uh, I want to make it clear I certainly don't speak for all community, but I'd like to share some of my thoughts based on my observations of being involved in the community sector at both the governance and operational level for the last 20 years or so. I was also really excited by what Gareth was saying and his court it all. I certainly think um, that reflected our observations in the community and social service sector too. I think for many local communities, there's recognition that climate change is a significant global issue, but the reality of responding with tangible, tangible solutions can feel um, quite out of control for low-income and marginalised communities. There can be a tension between members of low-income communities meeting basic needs and prioritising environmental outcomes. Jane Goodall has said it really well when she said, to fix the environment, you need to fix poverty. And this is a reality for many of our communities. The incentives to re reduce emissions and move to uh, sustainable or cleaner energy sources are targeted at people with financial means to access them. So what I mean by this is many of the solutions proposed provide incentives for those who can afford them, but penalties for those who can't. So for example, the government's proposed some excellent incentives around those purchasing EVs, while the cost of petrol edges higher. And buses can be a great way for people to navigate our cities without a vehicle for workers um, with pretty standard day jobs, but they're not a good option for our local nurses or orderlies working night shift or for cleaners who are often cleaning offices overnight. But it isn't all doom and gloom. Um, local communities are finding some really innovative local solutions to provide long-term sustainability. In terms of what's happening at a grassroots level, we're seeing some fantastic disruptive technology. The design of our towns and cities has traditionally favored car culture. And while EVs might be a solution for those in our community who have been able to afford them, and, and that is great. They don't disrupt that driving culture and provide a range of alternative solutions. E-scooters have been quite literally changed the culture of how a significant number of people are now getting around our city. And that cultural shift is what needs to happen if we want to get people out of cars. Solutions like that, though, need to be really well supported by our local government as well to make their usage safe for them and for pedestrians alike. Local infrastructure needs to support that shift to accommodate the uptake of e-scooters and the infrastructure updates will no doubt support more cyclists and pedestrians to get out of their cars. However, if we even look at the reaction to the Living Streets trial that we had um, on a couple of roads in Hamilton recently, the evidence um, to the pressure businesses and drivers put on local government to continue prioritising that car culture is, is of a concern. But alongside infrastructure and accommodation um, that accommodates various ways to navigate communities, um, buses, like I said, can be a great solution, but they can also be quite expensive for people on fixed incomes um, or people with minimal disposable incomes. Uh, Poverty Action Waikato have recently started circulating a petition through Action Station calling for council to make bus rides free for students, for community service card holders, and for people under the age of 25. Um, challenging our car culture, providing those disruptive technologies and providing affordable alternatives, I think is a crucial part of grassroots solutions to climate change. But another area that's been of critical importance has been around food sovereignty and food security. Community gardens, marae gardens, pātaka kai, food rescue locally being undertaken by Kaivolution. These are all grassroots solutions giving community access to healthy food options. The fact that properties have been getting smaller and rentals less secure has resulted in families and whānau struggling to feed themselves from their own gardens, not to mention the cost of setting them up um, and how time consuming they can be, which is hard for single parent families or people working long hours. Sharing community based plots for food growth and distribution has been a good supplement to individual households and to the community food network, um, which is an area we're seeing grow in the scale across the region. 
In terms of community organisations and what they're doing to review their own contribution to climate change, we have seen a progressive shift over the last sort of 10 years or so where groups are taking a lot more responsibility for recycling and reusing, um, for, for trying to go paperless, all of these sorts of things. Um, a lot of it's driven, you know, by cost for the fine, for the not-for-profit sector and certainly recycling and re reusing products works for us really well. But community houses are now planning and planting community gardeners, uh, gardens and partnering with local communities to tend um, the garden for their own benefit as well. We've seen excellent models of waste minimisation uh, organisations like the Seagull Centre in Thames and Extreme Zero Waste in Raglan. And these organisations have now actually been used as templates for others around the country. Some of our community organisations are seeking to understand their own energy use better to make better energy decisions. Recently, we had an opportunity given to us by Trust Waikato, who engaged uh, Toitu in Virocare to survey some Waikato community organisations, gathering data around things like flight and um, travel, electricity use, rubbish, etc. And then Toy2 provided a report that demonstrated the patterns of energy use. And fuel was really significant, but it was interesting because I think if it had been any other year than 2020, it would have looked far worse and it would have included a lot more air travel. Um, but of course, we couldn't do a lot of that uh, in 2020. But the evidence regardless was still really clear that the way our organisations individually and collectively use vehicles in particular is a real problem. Those findings are driving conversations now about what we might be able to do as a sector to reduce fuel consumption and demonstrate leadership in that space. And it looks like, you know, sorts of things we're, we're talking about, a shared fleet of electric cars, possibly a partnership with a company that's like a lime scooter equivalent with electric cars, maybe making better use of public transport, certainly ride shares, hubbing, all of these sorts of things. The reality is that data that's, has given us insights um, into the extent of the issue, and that can help drive some of those innovative solutions. So finally, I think um, local communities absolutely must be part of the solution to climate change. But it's essential to consider how we take everybody with us. Addressing issues of food security and transport needs are fundamental to being able to bring people along on a journey of change. If people's primary needs are met, they can start to consider what is beyond their immediate need. And if the solutions also align with more affordable alternatives to the older energy heavy ways of living, then we will actively engage these communities in the fight to address climate change. Um, that's me. I'm going to pass back to you, Kepa. Kia ora. Thank you, Holly. Um, and thank you to our other um, panellists, Mike, Andrew, um, Gareth and Stefan. Um, I'm going to... Um, uh, throw it open to all of our panelists now just to uh, reflect on their presentation and how it um, resonates with comments made in in the other presentations. I think I heard the word um, or not the word collaboration, but I was hearing that it's going to take a collective response and that it'll take um, decision making in the different areas that we influence uh, working together to get um, these results we're looking for. So um, who wants to open open it up? I've got a I've got a couple of points here that um, sort of I think respond to that. Um, one was and I was having a conversation with the electricity authority yesterday and they were asking um, the question how 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 did they um, increase energy literacy and, and and those sort of things and i said my answer to them was they don't uh we do you know the communities do the people in the communities um and, and yeah it, it goes back to education and behavior change and those sort of things and my point to them was that uh, we need to treasure or value the organizations that we have throughout i'd say all of our communities that people trust that they know and understand. You know, I was saying to them uh, quite often, uh, our guys might go in and say, you need to do a retrofit, you know, we, you need insulation, heating, blah, blah, blah. But it's not until the final order navigator goes in after and says, hey, you need to look at this and you need to also change the way that you uh, uh, live in your home and it's easy and it's quick and, and they keep coming back and keep saying the same thing. And that's what creates the change. That's what that's the that's the secret sauce. 
Um, and there's no fast tracking that. Um, and so those organizations that we have in our communities that people trust um, are incredibly valuable. And I think they've been undervalued for a long, long time um, and underinvested in for a long time. Uh, I think they're the agents of change that we need um, and, and they need to sort of get bigger and better at it. Um, the other point I'd make, just reflecting on what Stefan uh, was saying, is you know, like we've got a pilot out at Raglan where hopefully over the next sort of five years, we'll have five to 10 megawatts of, of community-owned uh, solar and maybe wind or biomass um, uh, put out there. And you know, I was just reflecting on, you know, you were talking about uh, the farming sector and quite often we have this rural urban um, bifo, you know, disagreements, uh, the media feel that quite often. And I think when we're talking about rural communities, you know, like Raglan and Morrinsville and Matty, yeah, we all know them. Um, we can't have that. We need to understand how farmers and the local communities interact with each other. And you know, the ideas like that biogas one, where fifty percent of their energy can be generated on site. Um, you know, we could be having solar farms, uh, agri PV solar farms on some of these uh, sites as well. So the farmers can engage in the local solution um, and, and the urban people in that, in that area can see how the farmers are engaging. It just kind of breaks down perhaps some of those barriers that, that people have. Um, yeah, I, I think we just need to, um, we need to explore how those uh, relationships can be um, strengthened up considerably. Yeah, that local yeah, exactly, Gareth, exactly, Gareth. And I think there's also an aspect here of uh, um, risk spreading. Um, that at the moment, you have your typical dairy farmer who knows that 95% of his milk product will be exported overseas. At the same time, we have a petroleum industry that's importing $8,000 million worth of petroleum every year and uh, everything coming from overseas. So, um, you know, we, we, wouldn't we be better off if we you know, would uh, minimize our export dependency in one area and uh, reduce our import dependency in another one by having you know, energy solutions on farms, um, by uh, you know, uh, broadening the products that a farm is producing? Does it all have to be milk or can't it be 10% you know, energy um, that uh, drives the process or you know if uh, a farm is supplying the milk to a dairy factory why can't it also grow the trees to fuel the boiler and to dry it into milk powder um this is would be beneficial from a, a ecological point of view you know think about uh, water pollution it's uh, better from you know, our, our climate point of view and uh, also from an employment point of view uh, because uh, you will um, have new employment opportunities for um, you know, people that manage those systems um, in those rural areas. Uh, there will be jobs in Apotheke. It will be jobs in um, in um, Stratford. Uh, not everything um, centralized in one refinery up in Northland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, I think the the age of local is coming. <laughs> you know, the, the centralized approach is, uh, um, works at economies of scale that um, have caused a lot of the problems that we've got. Uh, so we're needing to sort of almost revert back a little bit, you know, back to the future here a little bit in terms of some of the systems that we're going to need to develop uh, local rather than centralised. Uh, the other point I just wanted to make, and it might have been something that Jeff uh, uh, would have said earlier, is uh, this idea of distributed energy um, kind of flies in the face a little bit uh, with the current, current government thinking around Lake Onslow and the national battery, you know, having a massive lake as a as a as a battery for the for the grid. Um, our approach is that distributed energy, so energy generation and storage that's on the grid edge in these rural communities um, increases the resilience of the grid considerably, and we're really keen for that to be a genuine scaled uh, idea. For, for you know the whole country, you know, we should be talking about gigawatts of distributed energy on the grid edge, provided the grid can handle it, of course. And so storage becomes a big issue there. Um, but yeah, I, I I think it's it's a considerably more resilient um, 
option. And I think resilience is the is my, at risk of being an overused word like sustainability. I think it's going to be fairly critical for us to um, get our heads around what that means. I think one of the um, one of the issues around storage, uh, particularly electricity storage, if we're looking at batteries, for instance, is a lot of the uh, the economic model that's needed to support batteries is the energy trading. Uh, schemes and um, they start to fall over when the amount of storage uh, grows it's obviously a supply and demand type of a thing so um, naturally uh, you know in a situation where you've got uh, you know directors running companies they're looking making at making investments uh, they have to be able to weigh up the economic returns as well as the other returns the other thing I'd like to bring up as well is the is the uh, the car culture. It's interesting. I think the car the car culture and uh, and Holly mentioned that in Hamilton they recently trialled some um, some innovating streets projects. Uh, it's obviously built around the idea of um, getting people out of cars and getting people onto other forms of transport. Um, but I feel that one of the area that's been that's been ignored there is the um, is is and I think the byproduct of trying to do that is that you've created a uh, environment of congestion, car congestion, where the car drivers are basically being put under pressure, they're being squeezed, and they're hopefully with an outcome of being, oh, look, I'm sick and tired of the of the difficulty it's taking me to get from point A to point B in my car, I look for an alternative. But I look at it from a sort of a, um, a more mathematical and engineering perspective where I say, if you were in a bottling plant and you wanted to... Um, to get a better outcome, you look at say getting the bottle from the point A to point B faster and get the product into the bottle more quickly. And so, would another strategy in the uh, the car culture side of it be to try and actually improve the flow of cars rather than stifle the flow of cars, so that the journey time is reduced by twenty percent, for instance? And that uh, a good example I see is the opening up of the expressway between Hamilton and Auckland, where uh, the stretch of road that opened up. Uh, that stop, you know bypassed the uh, the Narawahia Tapri Huntley part of the drive, reduced the travel time by around twenty minutes. And if you multiply that by hundred thousand trips a day, it becomes a lot of uh, reduction in, in emissions. You know, so those things in themselves, as an investment, do have a positive outcome by the other side of it. I, I would suggest though that that still works within an environment. Um where the population is a particular size. It doesn't actually change the problem where the emissions are still occurring. I think, for example, about spending time in Hong Kong, which obviously has a much larger population, but navigating, getting around that city, it's one of the easiest experiences I've ever had in my life of anywhere. And it's a city that has invested significantly in an alternative way to get people from A to B. And I tell you what, they do that fast too. You're not standing for more than three minutes before you're on a train and you could be from Kowloon to the centre of Hong Kong inside five minutes. It's an absolutely um, incredible way to get round a city. Um, I do think that when we look at innovating cities around the world, cars are a part of yesterday's technology and that there are other technologies coming that are far more efficient um, and energy efficient um, to move us around cities. Afai, Holly, um, everybody's had a say, and um, I've really enjoyed hearing the different perspectives. I think we could probably keep discussing this because there are a number of um, issues that I, I guess seem to be pulling us in different directions. But at the at the foundation of the whole thing, I think we're all looking for the same outcome. So it's really good that um, some of the lesser heard voices have come through today. Um, thank you, Holly. And um, and Gareth and uh, Andrew was also uh, promoting, I think, um, a different position as well as Stefan. And within the governance level, Mike, um, good to hear about the battery, um, the battery storage, and the supply side incentivised changes that Wells looking for. I think there's still a little bit more work to do before we're all on the same page. But I think it's our different approaches that are going to get us there as we each share our understandings and 
um, the different things that are influencing our thinking so that we can work through those issues and, and find the solutions. Um, one of the things that occurred to me, Stefan, um, when you were talking about um, your comment and um, donut economics came to mind and then I thought, okay, what about donut energy cycles? <laughs> and um, what I think about donut economies and that is about decentralizing, uh, making the loops smaller um, and, and actually containing, uh, containing those processes so they get so large that they then dominate uh, the end point because of their own objectives. But um, I thank you, everybody. I've, I've enjoyed um, hearing your different perspectives and um, it's seemingly quite an eclectic um, group of opinions, but I think we're all striving for the same outcomes. And um, something I did hear was the importance of the flax roots or the grassroots um, coming along on this or actually driving this because it doesn't really matter where we are. We haven't got people coming with us on our journey. Um, we're not going to get there. So kia ora, thank you, everybody. Um, I'll just close us out um, and uh, wish you uh, the rest of a good day. So, um, tutua mai te whiwhia, mai te rauia. Uh, what that means is bind all in the world of light to everything else. Um, a saying that was provided to us by Homai Tafiti, and it really means we've got to think more broadly than just the economics um, and the things that are immediately in front of us. And we've got to bring all the other considerations. Um, one of the things that grabbed me was, um, I guess, doing things more intelligently and working together, but also allowing um, a equitable transition to um, different fuel sources and that, that Gareth talked about and that Holly picked up on as well. So, um, nō reira, kahi kai a te ahi o maumahara nai ni. Nō tū mea ko tō tātou tūpuna i ngā wao mua, ngā hunga tiaki mō wenei mō mō kōrero. So what I'm getting at there is um, these ideas of um, flax roots, grassroots initiatives, community, trust, working collectively together. I think these are older ways of doing things that have been lost to an extent with our, our current world that tries to work really fast but doesn't work as efficiently. Uh, maybe we've got to go back to those ways held by um, our ancestors and rethink this. Um, nei rā wāku mihi, uh, kia rātou ko whiturangi hia, o ti rā tātou ngā kanohi ora, mauri ora kato, koutou katoa. Thank you, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. The University of Waikato is proud to introduce the world's first Bachelor of Climate Change for the people who know there is no planet B. Gain the skills needed for the jobs of tomorrow. Contribute to a fundamental shift in the way we do business and go about our lives. Explore how Mātauranga Māori can bring perspective to the most pressing issue of our time. Apply now and carve a career where passion and purpose collide.